All the games we've studied so far have involved simultaneous moves, so we've represented them using the normal form payoff matrix. But many strategic interactions involve sequential decisions where players are choosing actions at different times. So to represent these interactions we need a different type of model, the extensive form game tree, which lets us encode the timing information of a sequential game. The core idea is that if players are making decisions at different times, then each point where a player is making a decision will be represented by nodes in a tree. We'll label the node with the player who is making a decision at that point, and then the actions available to a player when they're making their decision will result in branches of the tree. Those branches may lead to other decision nodes of various players in the game, or they may lead to an outcome where, as usual, we'll have a payoff for each of the players. So this game tree models an interaction where two players are trying to agree on how to divide up two items. First, player one proposes a split where they are offering either 0 or 1 or 2 of the items to player 2, and for each offer that might be made, player 2 can say yes or no. If player 2 accepts the offer, then each player's payoff is how many items they got, and if player 2 rejects the offer, neither player gets anything. And because this interaction involves player 1 making a decision first, and then player 2 responding to the result of that decision, it makes sense to represent this interaction with a game tree that lets us illustrate that sequencing of decisions. And now, if we want to analyze an extensive form game, we need to think about the tools and concepts we have developed, like strategies and equilibria, relate to this sort of model. And in particular, we think of a strategy in an extensive form game as a complete contingent plan of action that specifies what a player would do at any of their decision nodes. A good way to think about this is that a strategy can be implemented as a function that we could code, where that function takes as input any of the decision nodes for that player, and produces as output an action that the player would play at that decision node. And so these functions constitute pure strategies, and we can also think about the possibility of players using mixed strategies, where they randomize their choice of what program should govern their behavior in the game. But then, if we want to make predictions by computing Nash equilibria, it helps to express what is the set of possible strategies in an extensive form game. And since a strategy has to specify an action for every decision node, the set of possible strategies includes all the different ways that the player could combine decisions at every one of their nodes. So in this game, player 1 only has one decision node, and so they have three possible strategies corresponding to each of their three actions. But a strategy for player 2 could say yes at every node, or it could say yes at the first two nodes and no at the second, and so on. And so in this game, there are eight distinct functions that could govern player 2's strategy, because there are 2 times 2 times 2 possibilities for complete plans of action. And so if we were to convert this extensive form game into a normal form representation, we would have to write down a payoff matrix with 3 strategies for player 1 and 8 strategies for player 2. And this payoff matrix, where we have enumerated all of the strategies for each of the players, is known as an induced normal form game. And to fill in the payoffs in this payoff matrix, we need to, for each combination of strategies, figure out 
when that combination of strategies gets played, what outcome in the extensive form game will be realized, and fill in those payoffs in the corresponding cell. For example, if the first player plays strategy 1, and the second player plays the strategy yes, yes, no, then the actions selected will be first this one, and then, since yes, yes, no says yes at the second of the three nodes, player 2's action will be yes, and so the outcome will be 1-1, one, one, and those are the payoffs we've filled in for that cell. And now that we have a payoff matrix, we could absolutely inspect it and look for Nash equilibria. For example, this cell, where the first player plays 1 and the second player plays yes, yes, no, is a Nash equilibrium, because both players are best responding. We can also have extensive form games where the players have multiple opportunities to make a decision in sequence. Here, for example, player 1 makes the first decision, but depending on what actions are chosen, player 1 might have an opportunity to make another decision later. And so here, a strategy for player 1 has to specify what they will do at both of their decision nodes, and so they have four distinct strategies, A, E, A, F, B, E, and B, F. And again, using the induced normal form game, we could identify a Nash equilibrium. And in both of these games so far, we have found a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. And in fact, both of these games have several pure strategy Nash equilibria. I encourage you to look for others. And that's not at all a coincidence. We can in fact prove that every extensive form game where the players have perfect information must have at least one pure strategy Nash equilibrium. And the key intuition here is that there's no help in randomizing. We know that players are only willing to randomize if they're indifferent between two options. And so there's not a strict benefit to randomizing over just picking one of those options. The real reason that you randomize is to also make your opponent indifferent. But in these games, if, for example, player 1 were to randomize, player 2 gets to see the result of that randomization because after player 1 has played their first action, player 2 observes that before making their decision. And so as long as player 2 has full information, player 1 randomizing isn't actually going to affect player 2's decision, and there's no incentive for player 1 to do so. But not every game has perfect information. For example, all of the games we've been studying so far with simultaneous moves, the players are making their decisions, not knowing what the others will have done. And there are other ways that information might be hidden from players. And so we need some way in extensive form game models to include the possibility that players make decisions without perfect information. And we model those sorts of decisions using information sets. The idea of an information set is that it includes some collection of decision nodes that all belong to the same player, where that player can't distinguish which of those circumstances they're in when they're making their decision. And so that means that when a game arrives at some information set, the player only has one choice to make. They can't make separate decisions for the different nodes because they can't tell the difference between those nodes. And now, just like we translated an extensive game into the induced normal form, we can use the idea of information sets to transform a normal form game into an extensive form game. So here we have the classic payoff matrix for rock, paper, scissors. And in this payoff matrix, we are thinking of player 1 and player 2 as simultaneously choosing one of their actions. But in an extensive form game, we show the players as making sequential decisions. But strategically, it's the same if player 1 makes their decision first, but player 2 doesn't know about that yet when they're making their decision. And so we can have player 1's action come first, and then be followed by an information set 
where player 2 has not yet received the information of what player 1 did, and so player 2 makes their decision in ignorance, which is strategically equivalent to making the decision simultaneously, and so we get the same collection of outcomes, and we're fundamentally modeling the same interaction. And if we apply that same reasoning to the induced normal form, which is trying to capture a fundamentally sequential decision process, but using a model that implies simultaneous decisions, we can think of the simultaneous decision being made here as each player picking in advance of the interaction which strategy function they are going to follow to govern their behavior in the interaction. So we can do this translation from extensive form to normal form, or normal form to extensive form, but each model has situations that it's far more natural at modeling, specifically extensive form games for sequential decisions and normal form games for simultaneous decisions. But information sets in extensive form games are not just about translating normal form games, they're also crucial to thinking about certain sorts of sequential decisions. For example, we can have a case where player 1 makes decisions both before and after player 2, but when player 1 makes their second decision, they don't get to see which of player 2's actions was chosen. Or it could be the case that there is randomness in the environment where players are interacting, and we can model environmental randomness by having nodes in the game tree that don't belong to any of the players, and instead are labeled as belonging to nature, where we will then specify some probability distribution that nature uses to randomize between different possible states of the world. For example, we might be drawing a card from a shuffled deck, and then we can indicate with information sets when in the playing of the game will that information be revealed. And if we want to model players' decisions when there is randomness in the world, then we need to take into account their beliefs about what state they might be in. For example, here we have an information set where player 1 does not know whether they are at this node or this one, but when player 1 is making a decision at this information set, they know that they are more likely to be at this node, and specifically, they have beliefs that there's a 40% chance they're here and a 60% chance they're here, and they should take those beliefs into account when choosing their action for this information set. And even if the information that's hidden isn't a move by nature, but rather a move by another player, it still makes sense to express beliefs in terms of a probability distribution over the nodes in an information set. For example, if in Rock, Paper, Scissors, player 1 is randomizing their action a third, a third, a third, then player 2 can make their decision on the basis of a one-third probability at being in each state. Or if player 1's strategy is to randomize a half, a quarter, a quarter, then player 2's beliefs in the information set should take that into account. And so clearly, in these sorts of cases where there is imperfect information, our theorem that the game must have a pure strategy equilibrium no longer applies. We know that Rock, Paper, Scissors doesn't have a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. And for these other games with imperfect information, there may or may not be pure strategy equilibria, depending on the specific incentives the players face at their various information sets. So now we have the tool of extensive form games with or without perfect information to help us model circumstances where players make sequential decisions. We've seen that some of the concepts we use to analyze normal form games, like pure and mixed strategies and Nash equilibria, can also apply to extensive form games. But so far, those tools don't seem quite satisfactory for making good predictions in these circumstances. Because if we have to take our model and convert it back into a normal form game in order to make good predictions, then why did we bother with the extensive game in the first place? and because the induced normal form games tend to have tons of Nash equilibria, 
And so next time we'll start exploring equilibrium refinements for extensive form games that will help us be more precise in our predictions and also lead us to algorithms that will help more efficiently handle analyzing extensive form games.